Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Opinion or Opportunity. I am your host, Don Gringo, and we are back at it again. So today, I got another special one for you. We are talking flat earth and the Bible. The earth is flat and God tells you so. At least that's what we're going to talk about with Matt Long. Now, who is Matt Long? Well, Matt Long was born here in Fort Worth, Texas, the wonderful state that I live in. I don't live in Fort Worth, though. I'll just say that. And uh, while he was at the University of Oklahoma, he got a, a construction science degree. He's currently living in Alberta, Canada with his wife and a family of seven blended children and counting. And I mean and counting. Uh Go Matt. I don't know if I can do that, but go Matt. Um, he specializes in high-rise multifamily construction. He's the avid student of the Bible, in particularly the literal biblical cosmology. So this is someone who uh, knows exactly what he's talking about when it comes to the Bible, uh, when it comes to Flat Earth, you're going to find out in this episode. And I want you to follow along. This is also David Weiss' co-host on the Flat Earth podcast. So for all you Dave Weiss fans and for everyone who knows Matt Long, I finally got him. He's here and he's talking to you. So are you ready? Let's get into it. All right, Matt, it's on you. Introduce yourself. Well, my name is Matt Long, and I go by Woke Town on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. That's where you can find all my flat earth stuff. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas originally. I now live in Alberta, Canada. We're covered in snow right now, and I got a fire going here to the side. So try not to sweat too much in the interview and the <laughs> questions that you fire at me. But yeah, I'm, I'm a flat earther, and there's a, there's a number of reasons that I believe the earth is flat uh, because of scripture, because of logic, and because of experimentation. So um, we can start in, in any of those you'd like to start in. All right. Well, let's start in. I'll leave experimentation for the last. I think that would be good. Okay. I think let's get into a little bit of the logic. But before we move forward, just so everyone knows, you are David Weiss's co-host on one of his podcasts, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. David mentioned cool. you. I just want to make sure that we're very clear. You are the gentleman that that he says that you're the That's co-host. Correct. Yes, I, I tend to forget that. Dave usually pays me five bucks anytime I say his name in an <laughs> interview, so I should remember that. I think he's holding my money for me somewhere. I've never seen it, but he says he's holding it. So yeah, I'm the co-host of the Flat Earth Podcast with Dave Weiss of DITRH, and that's an incredible podcast. If you guys haven't checked it out, we joke that it is the biannual flat earth podcast because they've been getting more and more scarce but I, th I think we should as you suggested we should revamp that up because we've got we've got a lot of fans that really enjoy that show and even if you're not a flat earther it's a great show to listen to because we talk about current events and we talk about it from an awake an awakened standpoint yes we touch on flat earth in every episode but it's it's a great show you guys should check it out no, absolutely. And I got I to gotta say that uh, since I met Dave and, and had the conversations, I'm not saying I'm a flat earther by far. Uh, there's a lot that I need to reconcile in my head mentally and what I have you before I could ever get there. But sure. I want to just say it like I have said it in every show that if you're an intelligent person or a halfway intelligent person who's open minded and you need to be open minded that you definitely you and David make people think. That there's that there's something to actually think about. That like it's if 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 you just like theorizing and speculating, it's a great topic, really, because you could go back and forth on this topic forever. It's a really great topic if you if you open your mind and just want to say, I just want to have a conversation, even if I don't believe in it. I want to have a conversation and tell me why you believe that. It's like, okay, well, there's some things that make you think like well that that could be right that that not saying the earth is flat but what you're pointing out is like yeah okay makes you think yeah and that's that's that kind of brings us into the logic topic because it's my opinion that a lot of this is, has been pulled over our eyes to make us think we can't trust our senses because everyone experiences <clears throat> a flat non-rotating earth you, you go outside you look you could see the horizon you can't feel the spin now i'm not saying that Mainstream doesn't have an explanation for all that because they do. It's whether or not you buy their explanations. And that's where the logic comes in is flat earthers did not become flat earthers by 
wanting to choose a different social status because you don't go up in life when you choose to be a flat earther. You, you, you take it down a couple notches and there are consequences to becoming a flat earther socially if you're open about it. But the, we, we became flat earthers because we started looking into the ball model. We started looking into the heliocentric model and asking tough questions, right? That, that don't necessarily have good answers. So when you start finding out that, hey, it was proven in 1887 that this place isn't moving and that experiment has been repeated as, le as lately as 2009. And no matter how far you look, you can't measure curvature. No matter how high you go up, now, now, you mentioned the experiment, so explain the experiment before we go further, so everyone understands what sure. you're talking about. Okay, so I'm talking about Mickelson and Morley experiment. Not sure if Dave mentioned it or not, but it's an experiment that was done in 1887 by two gentlemen, last name Mickelson and Morley, that's what it's named after, and they were trying to prove the existence of something called an ether cloud. Back then, uh, the ether was, was a big deal. They were thinking it was something that helped transport light, essentially, like a current of, of some kind. Of some sort or ether wind if, if I said it correctly and what they did was they took um, light beams and then different uh, mirrors at 90 degree angles and essentially bounce these different colored light beams around and the theory was that if uh, one if earth was moving and two if there was an ether wind that these light beams would not arrive back at the start at the same time well no matter how many times they did it the light continued to arrive at the same time meaning that either A, this place isn't moving, or, or B, what science says now is that, well, you, well, there's a quote from Albert Einstein saying that um, he doesn't believe that you can prove the motion of Earth through an optical experiment, through the use of light. And then, of course, you have, he wrote special uh, theory of relativity, which basically says all things are relative and light moves independent of motion and um that was the experiment that was the explanation to cover it up and and you'll see like with every proof there there is an explanation to cover it up so if if the place isn't moving right based on that experiment which was repeated as lately as 2009 officially um and we talk about the lack of curvature which we can get into later if it's not moving and you can't detect curvature then to me, the flat, non-rotating model is a good place to start speculating on, on what, what is happening, that how this place is working. And, and that is what all the ancient cultures of the world thought this place was. They, they had to be told that they were on a spinning ball flying through space because they wouldn't perceive it by just walking outside. Well, and by that, the way... With that being said, by, though, I mean, I want to yeah. talk about one thing Dave brought up, which was... In the last show I did with him, I think at the end when I talked about why I, I say, well, it's definitely something to think about was um, he brought up, and again, you're talking about it now, but we got to talk about the time frame. So he's saying that the uh, global ball theory, whatever way you want to call it, the heliocentric, whatever model you want to talk, was it's not old. It was brought up, it started being taught in what, the 20s and 30s, correct? Well, so that Dave, Dave has that theory. Yes. So, um, and are you talking, so you're saying the ball theory? Yeah. The, the, the earth yeah. is, the earth is round. That, right. Yeah. That whole so model that, started being taught in the twenties and thirties. Yeah. So Dave has interviewed some people, I forget what you call them when they're over a hundred years old, but they actually remember being taught that the earth was flat in, in school. And, and Dave thinks, and I'm, I'm not quite there with him, but he thinks that this is a young theory, this whole thing. And the fact that um, people thought the earth was a globe back in the 1500s and 1600s, he, think that, he thinks that's a lie. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just, I, I'm not quite to that point with Dave. Um, it is interesting, you know, that, uh, you know, you get Universal Studios, they have their logo of the, the spinning earth. And that, that came around about 1927, which, you know, that's 40 years before we could even go high enough to see if we actually were living on a spinning ball flying through space. Um, but yeah, I think, I think ancient cultures, obviously, they, they all believed we were in some sort of flat existence with a dome over us. Um, and, you know, they, their calendars, their star-based calendars, that all worked. Like they had a functioning system 
before being told they were on a spinning ball flying through space. You know, I brought and, that up in the last show too. It's like I told Dave, that's the other thing that really makes me think twice is, you know, for thousands of years, you've had humans, you know, sailing by the stars and the stars have not moved in thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Literally, you can go out today and sail and navigate by the same stars that they did back then. It would still be accurate. So that's the one thing that also made me think that, you know, I'm not saying that the flat earth is correct, but there's there's something wrong with the model that we're being taught because, yeah, with all the technology we have that supposedly we can go in space, we can see galaxies millions of light years away, and we can do all this stuff. Well, how come we can't measure how far a star has moved in our hemisphere, right? right. How come we can't measure that? Why is it the same? And don't sit there and tell me, that, oh, it's because light travels so fast from a far distance because under Dave's math, if we're moving a half a million miles per minute per year, whatever it is, it equals out to trillions and trillions and trillions of miles per year that we're traveling through the solar system in one direction. These planets are supposedly traveling in their own direction, right? And then supposedly they're all, we're all in the same place. And now you take those trillions of trillions of miles that and we're talking tens of trillions of miles that we've traveled and times it by 2,000, 3,000, 8,000. Mm -hmm. And now yeah. all of a sudden you're in a number that's not saying incalculable, but unconscionably immeasurable visually. I mean, you're just not going to know it. So it's like, yeah, something doesn't add up. We have all this technology, but we can't do this. So yeah, uh, you've got, you've got the ancient, you get ancient, um, uh, structures that have been built where they drilled a hole to look at the North star thousands of years ago. And you can still go there on a certain time at a certain day of the year, look through there and you're looking at the same star. You know, how, how is that possible? It's a great point. That that's a great point of logic. Well, we talked about logic, so we know where you stand logic. Logically, there's a lot of things that would, would challenge anyone's thought perception and, and make them think. So let's talk about the religious aspect, because that's where mm -hmm. supposedly your specialty lies, is, is the religious sure. aspect. Now, are we going to talk religion as in one religion or religion as in plural? Well, I, I'm obviously an expert on Christianity and the Bible. And again, I, I, that's a self-proclaimed expert. No one has called me an expert <laughs> outside of this. So, okay, okay, that's fair. Um, it's, it's something I've spent a lot of time studying in the Bible. Now, if I were to speak to the Quran, I've heard from Muslim followers of mine that have, I don't have Muslim followers, but people who subscribe to my channel who are Muslims have told me that the Quran is also a flat earth book. So I, I would like to touch on what the Bible says in regards to the shape of the earth, since that's what I've studied more. Well, let's, let's face it too. It's also the oldest text ever printed and widely published text in the world since the inception of the printing press. I mean, yep. I mean, it is what well, it is. And I, and I tell people that all the time and people just don't believe me. If you go back and you study your history, the Bible is the most widely spread printed book in the world since the invention of the printing press period. Well, and, and make, and that's, that's probably a good place to start because it's one of the reasons why I base so much of my belief or um, my worldview on it. Because when I was, when I was in my twenties, it was, it was the spinning ball heliocentric model that made me not want to read the Bible because according to page one of the Bible, it was it was a book about stories and myths and legends like it didn't make sense page one didn't line up you know the six day creation didn't line up with the big bang right that happened billions of years ago and and led to this but through my process when i started reading the bible again in my late 20s i found out that it's actually the most historically accurate and reliable book in the history of the world and if anyone wants to go to my youtube channel they could find uh, a talk I did on the reliability of the scriptures. We'll put that description. We'll put your channel in the description below along with sure. other stuff that you provide me. It'll sure. So what I found out was the, the manuscript evidence for the Bible and its circulation, like you touched on, is far and above any other book in the history of antiquity. The, the second place book is Homer's Iliad, okay? And the way they measure the, the accuracy of ancient texts is, one, the number of manuscripts that they have, which are, are basically copies of the original, and then two, how close to the original were those copies written? So, for and, and you never have originals, by the way. You never have because uh, you know they're written on parchment with like or bark with uh, you know charcoal, and that that stuff's just not made to last forever. 
Well, it's like I mentioned last time. That that right there is the, and I don't want to get deep into religion. Me being, uh, used to be Catholic, baptized, confirmed, was an altar boy, the whole nine yards. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, some people thought I was going to be a priest. I joined the Marine Corps. You know, it's totally different. But hey, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all find God our own way, right? So, um, sure. but that was probably the one thing that you just touched on that I had an issue with that made me leave religion as far as in the context of, I believe I'm agnostic. I'm not atheist. I believe something's there. I just think man screwed it up. And let me explain why. So you would know this better than me, but I definitely know that uh, when it comes to the Bible, we've had, when it comes to major revisions, not minor, major revisions, we've had three major revisions in the history of the Bible. And I'm not talking minor. Minors, there's been 20 more. And the issue I have with the revisions was um, the initial thing about religion was to bring everyone together and lift you up, but yet the revisions to the Bible the Bible was actually dumbed down to the masses, not the masses lifted up to the Bible and the teachings of Jesus and, and God and what not have you. So wh- whoever you believe in, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but that's what it was meant to be. But yet the Catholic Church and at that time, which was the predominant, not Christian, but Catholicism was predominant, was they dumbed it down, which in my my interpretation of dumbing something down is words lose their meaning. Right, when you dumb something down, it's no longer has original context, original meaning, original whatever. You lose it somewhere. So that was when my 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 biggest reason for having a problem was man has always screwed everything up. If God did it one way, why would you change it? Sure, and, and if if you wouldn't mind letting me touch on that, sure. if, uh, if you don't mind. So my my reaction to that would be. Um, you know, not having the original in the in the in the context of ancient documents is is not a big deal when you have a lot of copies. Because, for example, we don't have originals from Shakespeare. We don't have originals from Socrates. In fact, the only reason we know what Socrates wrote about is because Plato wrote about Socrates. And and Plato, if if we just put it in context a little bit, Plato, we have seven handwritten manuscripts that people copied Plato's work from. And the oldest one we have is written within 1500 years of when Plato lived. So not very close to the original, right? Yeah. Uh, you, have the, you have the Iliad, which is the second most circulated book in the history of the world, written by Homer. We have 643 manuscripts copied. The oldest was copied down within 500 years of the original. So Homer, it, at least getting within 500 years, and because we have 643 of them, you know, if you go in there and you find a mistake, you can check the other 642 and see if that was written correctly. In the case of the New Testament, for example, there's not 643 and it's not written within 500 years. The oldest that we have was written within 35 years that the events took place. And we don't have 643. We have over 24,000 manuscripts to confirm what was actually written down and if let's say let's but let's say we didn't have those let's say the bible was like socrates and we didn't have any manuscripts you can put together an entire new testament with the exception of 11 verses from the letters and sermons of the early church fathers which were written within 250 years of the original so still better than homer and there's not 24,000 of those but there's 86,000 and then when you take that and compare it to the extra biblical references to Jesus Christ, which there are more than Alexander the Great. There's more extra biblical references to Jesus Christ than Alexander the Great. It tells the same story of what the 24,000 manuscripts and 86,000 quotations tell. So, um, and then you have you have the encapsulation of the Old Testament in the Septuagint, which was 300 years before Jesus was born, or 250. And you know he, he comes alive. And and again, this is what I believe. You know, he comes to earth, lives, fulfills the prophecies, including ones that he couldn't, he couldn't control, like where he would be born, what tribe he'd be born into, how he would die, uh, what he would be portrayed for, things like that. And, and then you have the, the recap of that whole story in the New Testament, including Jesus appearing to over 500 people at one time after he died. And, and, and what's unique about the Bible is it's not one book, right? It's, it's, right. it's over 60 books written by over 40 authors, over 1,500 years of history. And these guys in the New Testament, 
the re, the real people, right? There, you have Paul talking to Timothy, telling him to, "Hey, bring the coat that I left in Trous, right? Like, like it's it's things were happening, you know. Right. He calls his grandmother by name, and then and they they weren't they weren't writing about what they believed. Like Acts four twenty says, "For we cannot help but declare what we have seen and heard." Like they're they're seeing these things, and they're writing them while the witnesses were still alive, saying things like you guys saw this too. All this happened in your midst. None of this happened in a corner. And so for me, come like coming from a very close to atheist background um, and, and not, not, not even agnostic. I, I was worse. Like it, it was, I was, um, <laughs> like it was. Well, I we was started angry. out at different points and then we're ending at different points and, and yeah. I get it. And so let me just, so we can move on to the, 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 sure. to the part that sure. we're here to talk about. I just want to make it clear that it's not the Bible itself. It's the revisions I have a problem with. I, man has always been uh, faulty, greedy, um, power hungry, whatever have you. And sometimes the Bible has been used for that purpose. And when you talk about revisions, if the Bible has been used uh, in bad context, you know, talk about the Crusades and other things of that nature. I mean, it's not like the Catholics have a, a clean past. Uh, we don't. It's just a fact of life, right? And again, that's not God. That's humanity. That's what it is. And I don't have that faith in humanity to sit there and say that the accuracy is uh, there, because when you change context and you change meanings for me, um, it's... It's not a good thing, especially after the acts you hear about that were well before your time and how it was used for those bad acts. So with getting to that, that's where I come from. I mean, I'm not saying what you're saying is going to be fault. I'm not judging. I'm not challenging. I just it's great to have that. You have the knowledge. So we're going to take on that knowledge. So let's talk about Flat Earth. And you started talking about it. So you say page one. Let's talk about page one. OK, sure. Yeah, let's start at page one. So page one. Right. It talks about a six day creation. All right. Totally opposite, something very different than what evolution says. Evolution says that nothing exploded and created everything. And that happened, you know, billions of years ago. And now we've evolved from slime into, you know, these fully advanced beings. Now, the problem with that is, you know, the Bible talks about giants in our background. The Bible talks about um, people living for hundreds of years. And I'm talking about from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11, which is my favorite part of the Bible. That's, that's the creation account all the way to the Tower of Babel essentially. Okay. You got people living for hundreds of years. You have this, the earth created before the sun. Uh, you have the whole, you have the whole, everything created in six days. You've got a tower whose top was being built into heaven is what they claimed they were doing. Um, you've got, uh, you've got the flood of Noah, all kinds of crazy stories that, you know, when I first came back to the Bible, I, uh, from the outside looking in, you know, my, my perception of the Bible were based on other people's opinions until I started reading it for myself. And once I did that, I realized one, it wasn't exactly like I thought it was going to be. It was a little more like Lord of the Rings than Planet of the Apes, you know? <laughs> and so, because it talks about angels coming down and having children with the daughters of men in Genesis 6, like that is some wild Nephilim. stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah, Nephilim. So Nephilim, my, my, my research, the Nephilim was what brought me to flat earth because I was watching a lot of stuff from a guy who was talking a lot about Nephilim. And then he did a flat earth show. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, just <laughs> insane. And, um, and what happened to me was, I feel like God punched me in the chest. As soon as I heard it, he started talking about the Bible verses. For, he talked about the proofs first, then he said scripture. And I, I was like floored. I was like, yeah, I missed it. The Bible's a flat earth book. And I, you know, we can go through a lot of verses and we will, but the very easy thing to do would be for someone to Google Hebrew cosmology and just start looking at the images and you'll start seeing cross sections of, um, of different, let me just see if I had one here. Um, yep, here we go. So this is a book. Well, it's not great. Um, anyway, so you'll, you'll start seeing cross sections of what the ancient Hebrews believed. And, and they believed in a flat earth set on pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were all placed inside that dome. And on the outside was water. You know, um, I've got a little 3D printed, you know, shot of the flat earth there. And, um, you know, if you turn this on the side, put what they call the firmament. Okay, so that was created on day two, the dome. And, you know, if you can picture, um, just, per sorry, just pretend this is like submerged in water. 
Yeah. <laughs> Pretend this was at the bottom of a bathtub, okay? And you took this outside the water and then set it down on there and then closed in the air right on top of that, right? Because if you don't move that deal, the air is going to stay in there. And that's, that's just kind of, that's what I think it is. And that's what the ancient Hebrews believe that on the outside of here is water and on the inside is the sun, moon, stars, planets, all that stuff. And, and we're in there too. So let me ask a question then. That's, that's a very interesting concept because that's a little bit different than, than what David brought about because he really didn't go into the, no, the dome and now he's like, I don't know, I don't know. And I don't know. And that's great because now you're giving a different view. So technically, Technically, if the stars are inside, is that does that dome just cover the flat earth or would that dome encompass a lot more? Because if that's the case where the stars are actually inside this dome, that means the galaxy is actually inside this dome. So space exists, but not as we perceive space to exist. So my opinion on space is that, yes, it exists, but not as we perceive it. So space is anything above 62.5 miles. And, and I believe, one, I believe there's a dome because in the 19, well, scripture says it, but also in the 1958 Encyclopedia Americana, it talks about how they discovered a dome at the 80th, 80th degree south at about 13,000 feet. So really? 80 degrees, yeah, so 80 degrees south would be way out here towards the edge. And so as you turn it up, you know, 13,000 feet is very low, but if you imagine that, that it actually rises as it goes, you know, over, over the North Pole in the center, um, so, um, and that's an encyclopedia, if, correct? You said encyclopedia Americana, 1958, really under, I under the heading, under the heading Antarctica. So, and that's, that's immediately following operation, um, deep freeze operation, high jump. These were, these were U S military operations in Antarctica, which Again, we don't, we don't believe Antarctica is a continent at the bottom of the globe, but rather a continental ice shelf that surrounds the flat earth and potentially is where the dome or firmament rests. Now, some people think that there may be more land beyond Antarctica out here and that the, the firmament actually comes down further out. I think it's Antarctica. I think that's it. Um, <clears throat> I think Antarctica are the ends of the earth, okay, as, as the Bible says. And so... Um, the so the firmament created on day two right uh, encyclopedia americana talks about the dome that they found i think in operation deep freeze they, they actually reached the dome because immediately after that nasa was started they have the treaty of antarctica which it was 12 nations that decided all right antarctica is off limits for any private exploration only government sanctioned stuff all 12 of those countries now have space programs um, they immediately started something called Operation Fishbowl, which is where they started exploding high altitude nukes in our atmosphere, in my opinion, trying to test the height of the dome because, and you know, Operation Fishbowl is a funny name because the biblical model of this place is a glass dome surrounded by water, <laughs> right? Okay. So let's call it Operation Fishbowl. And yeah, so I, I have, you know, the fact that, so we were talking about space, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. You've given a lot more interesting information than I, than I expected. I mean, I, I don't mind the mix. I mean, you're, I mean, sure. this is more that's making me think because like, I didn't know about the encyclopedia. I didn't know about sure. certain things. And when you there's, bring that up, that's, that's enlightening. There's so much out there and it's so hard to find now, you know, because of censorship, but the, um, like I said, space is anything above the Kármán line is what it's called. It starts with a K and that's hundred kilometers or 62.5 miles. And I got to talking about the dome here being 13,000 feet and then likely much, much higher, uh, hundreds of miles, maybe a thousand miles high at the, at the center. So there's a lot of room above 62 miles for things to exist in quote unquote space. Now, I don't believe in planets, okay? Like, I don't even think the Earth's a planet. The Earth is a system, okay? And just because I can look in a telescope and see Saturn and see Jupiter, which I've seen through my own lenses, I, I see lights in the sky, okay? But I don't think they're places we can go. Same thing with the moon. I'm not sure what the moon is. I know it's a, I know it's a great light per Genesis, and I know the sun is a great light. I've got some theories 
you know, the, the Bible talks about, we had evening and morning three times before the sun was even created. So th there's, there's some stuff that I, I don't understand. That would mean that, that would mean the concept of time was predates man or predates sure. the yeah. world. Actually, I mean, not the world, because if God formed the world then you know, you have your, your time before the sun was even born. So yeah, you're talking time is a relative theory that was existed even way back then. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's possible that, you know, light was created on day one. Okay. And when light is on the outside of a lens, this shape, when it hits it and goes through, it immediately goes into a focal point. And so it's possible that the sun is a focal image of the light beyond the firmament, that the, the sun is kind of like a rainbow. Like you could just, you can't, one, you, you can't get to it, right? Like it, as you get closer, it gets further away. And so, and its position is dependent upon the observer. And I think the moon is similar, um, but somehow they are light giving objects. And, you know, the moon, for example, the Jesus talks about in Matthew 24, how, uh, in the end, in the end days, the, the sun will be darkened and the moon will cease to give her light and all the stars will fall from heaven. Well, this, that, that, that's, that brings up a few things about Jesus's view, right? One, I, I believe he had the Hebrew view of the cosmology because he says that the sun um, will be darkened, but the stars will fall. So he's automatically saying that the sun is not a star. Um, he's not going to, he's not saying that there's going to be billions of years to wait for these things to get here. Um, stuff actually happens after that. So he doesn't think the stars are billion or millions of times the size of the earth. And he said, he talks about the moon giving off its own light. And, and we believe as flat earthers that the moon is self-illuminating. We, we think the phases are, have a relationship to where the sun is, but we think the moon is giving off its own light. We think the moon gives off cold light and that can be measured at night with a laser thermometer, you know, in this, and during the day when you're in the sun and you go in the shade, you cool off, right? Because uh, you're, you're hiding from the warm light of the sun. Well, it's the opposite at night. If you go into the shade at night, you get warmer. And that's because the moon is giving off cold light. And you can test that. You can shoot the ground. I never noticed that. You can shoot the ground. It's a couple degree difference in Fahrenheit. Uh, you can shoot the ground open to the moonlight and shoot the ground in the shade. And so if the moon is giving off cold light, then it's obviously not reflecting the warm light of the sun and thus, in my opinion, self-illuminating. And yes, of course, the, the phases do appear to be tied to where the sun is, but I think that's an electromagnetic relationship, not a reflection of light relationship. And, and if you take a look at the moon, go just Google picture of the moon, full moon, and the thing looks like a light bulb. It looks bright. You can look at it. And this goes back to the logic. It does not look like a dull dust ball that the astronauts were walking on in the 1960s and 70s. It just doesn't look like it. I show it to my, my nine-year-old. I'm like, do these two things look like the same thing? And she's like, no. And, and, I, and she's like, so where are they talking about the astronauts? And I was like, well, I don't know the answer to that. But. Well, that's a definitely interesting. Like I never, never realized that about the uh, moonlight and the temperature difference. That's, and that's measurable, you said, correct? That's measurable. That 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 falls into the that falls into the um, category of experiment because that is um, that's provable. And you know, again, you're going to be able to find a mainstream explanation for it. But again, that's where you have to apply your logic and your senses to these things. Because one of the things I talk about is that evidence is the same for everyone. Okay, there's a great meme where there's a number on the ground, and and one guy standing on one side and says that's a nine. The guy standing on the other side says nope, that's a six. They're, they're both looking at the same evidence. Me, who is a creationist and an evolutionist, could both look at the same fossil. One guy's going to say that was laid down over millions of years of non-catastrophic processes. I'm going to say, nope, it was laid down in Noah's flood. It's the same piece of evidence, right? The moonlight is the same piece of evidence. The, the curvature, the lack of curvature is the same piece of evidence. A, a glover is going to say, no, light bends and refracts, and that's why you can see things over the curve. And I'm going to say, no, that you're talking about a mirage. Mirages look different than actual uh, buildings across Lake Michigan, for example. So um, that people will see things on YouTube, and they'll see things in the mainstream media, and they'll say, oh, I'm looking at evidence. No, you're looking at an interpretation of evidence. Evidence is numbers and readings and measurements. It's people interpret that evidence and they interpret it with a worldview. 
the pr- the problem though with with when it comes to that, like you pointing out numbers and stuff, is still it has to be a um, agreed upon logic, right? Like one plus one is two, right? Because if, totally. you're talk- if you're talking to somebody else and they don't agree, one plus one is two. It's it's not the same evidence, and I think that's one of the things that really needs to be brought about. And I think if you look at it through that lens as well, if you get enough people believing one plus one is two then you can pretty much make them believe anything, right? I mean, because you've already got them to agree to one point, so now we just need to push it a little further, where if you put one one, one and one next to each other, I may say it's 11, right? Yep. Why yep. not? I mean, I mean... You no, you're, you're exactly right. And, you know, we were talking business before, but I'm sure there's cases where you have to analyze people's proposals, right? And you got to make sure they're apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Otherwise, you can't even have a conversation. You, you can't even say which one's better because like you said, you're coming from two different places and and there's so many things with the flat earth that, um, that people think are a result of them living on a ball, but it actually just correlates to them living on a ball and and these same things can correlate to a flat earth doesn't mean they're caused by it and and one of my examples i always give is um let's say the clock strikes noon and i go eat lunch okay well the clock didn't cause me to go eat lunch it just i happen to go eat lunch at noon and that can be proved if one time i go eat lunch at a different time or another time i go eat lunch and there's not even a clock in the room now we proved the clock didn't cause me to go eat but we didn't prove why i went to go eat right and so a lot of these things like sunrise, sunset, circumnavigation, not falling off the edge that people think prove they live on a ball, if, if they have explanations on a flat earth and we can prove we don't live on a ball due to lack of curvature and lack of motion, maybe we should have a conversation about it, right? And um, No, it's definitely different. So let me, let me ask you a question because, you, you know, when we talk about facts and we talk about agreed upon facts, so... Where's the separation in facts, right? How do, where do we get to the point of separation in facts when it comes to flat earth and say, we'll call it ball or globe theory as you see it? Where, where do we digress? Sure. So I think the big, the big thing that you'll find when, when someone is proving that we live or proving that we live on a globe, the, the one thing that they will always do is take things that flat earthers do not believe in and say that that's why we're stupid because they'll take things that that we don't believe in for instance space we don't believe in space right or outer space they'll they'll take things like that and apply logic to them say see flat earthers are idiots um and the reason they do that is because they get a lot of their information from the flat earth society which is a total joke of an organization i've never met anybody from there i've met thousands of flat earthers i, I don't even know what that is i think it's controlled so what opposition. is so dave has mentioned that as well so i didn't press him on this and i'm not really going to press you but let me let me ask what what is the difference between the flat earth society versus flat earther um so i haven't spent much time looking at it but from what i understand they still push that earth is flat and in the solar system flying through space which doesn't work like gravity wouldn't work on that. Like it would be, uh, gravity would increase as you walk to the edge of the flat earth and, you know, uh, people will be standing in, in funny positions and um, th- there's just so much that doesn't work about it. They say that the earth is accelerating upward and that's what creates gravity. And it's, it's, it's total illogic. And um, so those are a couple things. So but, what, what is the flat earth to believe on gravity? And what does the Bible uh, say about it? Sure. So, um, well, Bible says that through Christ, all things hold together. So that's, that's an interesting statement. Um, (laughs) but I would say in general, um, flat earthers do not believe in gravity. They believe in density, buoyancy, and electromagnetics, which, you know, you can use electromagnetics to defy gravity. Um, there's a great, um, you, in a, if you look in a, up, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way, isn't gravity electromagnetics anyway? Well, gravity, the existence of it, in my opinion, has never been proven. Okay. Yes, I can take physics equations and say that that ball will fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. And, and I can create an equation that's going to describe something, but it doesn't prove the existence of it. And if you look up quotes from Isaac Newton, he had his doubts about his own theory 
and it, and it is a theory. And they're, they supposedly discovered what they call gravity waves in this experiment they did in, I think it was either New Mexico or Arizona, it was called LIGA. Um, it was this big array that they set up, okay? And supposedly there were two black holes a billion light years away orbiting each other and that were gonna collide and they were gonna measure the ripples in space time that, that came back, okay? Um, one, they, they, they have never been able to detect gravity waves from the moon or the sun, which is close. The moon is 240,000 miles away. The sun is, the sun is eight light minutes away, okay? So if you wanna get to a billion, I mean, if you wanna get to a billion light years, you're going to multiply eight light minutes times 65,000 to get to one light year, and then you're gonna multiply it by a billion, okay? And then you're gonna turn out the lights because they're black holes. There's no light coming out of them, right? And so they say that these two black holes collide and they measure the, the ripples in space-time. They measured how much space-time distorted from a billion light years away. And the amount that space-time distorted, they said was less than the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. That's what they measured. Okay. But yet we can't, yeah, so, we can't, we can't measure the distance a star moves in the sky, right? Over right, thousands right. of years. Right. But, but we, and that's why we, I say, yeah. that's why I always point out to everyone who's listening to the show. It, I'm not saying I buy into it, but it, when you talk facts and you bring in numbers and you bring in certain things, it's kind of like, well, there's something wrong. It may, it's not a, no, the growth yes. theory becomes a, not a perfect system there. Yes. But you find doubts in, in right. that. That's Too why more, I say I'm not a believer, but you gotta, you have to admit at some point there are some things that are not perfect. And I have yet to find someone, by the way, who will come on and who will say Dave is wrong. I have yet to find, if anyone listening to the show knows someone who will gladly do it, I will gladly have them. But I am telling you right now that when you talk about this and with numbers and with logic mm -hmm. and with facts, it, it, it shoots holes in certain theories, which is absolutely sure. correct. I mean, that's correct. Yeah, absolutely. So. And, and their experts will tell you that they, they don't actually know, you know, if, if the earth was a beach ball, Okay, let's say the Earth is a globe, okay, and let's say it's the size of a beach ball. The International Space Station is hovering a half inch above the surface of that beach ball, and we cannot go beyond that point. That's, that's, what, that's what Barack Obama said, that's what astronauts say, that we cannot get out of low Earth orbit. We can't solve the problem. We can't get through the Van Allen radiation belts, is what they say, right? Somehow we went through it six times there and back on the way to the moon, but since we didn't know they existed then, it didn't bother anybody, right? So um, if that's the case, if everything beyond the, beyond the half inch mark- so How the hell are they playing a Mars mission in a couple of years that's supposed to take place? They say that the biggest challenge that they're trying to get past is going through the Van Allen radiation belts. Now, in my opinion, it's the firmament. You can't get past it, but that's, that's my opinion. So um, we were talking about gravity. Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about how they, you know, they created something called dark matter, right? Because they say that we can only observe 4% of the matter in our universe based on the amount of gravity that we detect, right? So they create something called dark matter, which is now called dark energy, right? It's all very evil sounding. And well, basically you know, to put it plain and simple, it's the darkness of space, right? That that somehow doesn't exist, but now after this whole experiment you're talking about, all of a sudden it does exist. You're 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 walking through something. It's like you're walking through air. You're walking through right. something all of a sudden. Sure, sure. And and then you've got Michio Kaku, who's the Japanese guy. He's always on Discovery Channel. Um, he says that the um, that in cosmology, he talks about if you're, if you're off by a factor of two or a factor of 10 in science that you, you call that's terrible, you throw away the theory. He said in cosmology, they're off by a factor of 10 to the power of 120. He says it's the largest disconnect between its experiment and science in the history of the world. Like they, they it's all theory. And, it, and then it's theory based on theory based on theory driven by worldviews that Obviously, none of those worldviews, in my mind, involve an all-loving creator. Like they, they all, they all are based on the nothing exploded and created everything, and and their goal is to remove God from the equation. But um, sounds like a Democrat to me. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Not trying to be political, but let's face it, they take God out of more things than anybody else in the United Absolutely. States. I mean, yes. truly. Instead of saying that God is whoever you want to believe and that the United States has its own tradition where it was founded on, 
you know, leave leave God alone and leave God out of it because we respect. Because again, that was a constitutional right. Whatever God you believe in, that is your constitutional right, right? And yep. and yet we can't seem to leave that alone. But we'll not go there. So let's get back into the religious side of this, right? Sure. So, um, because right, well, right now, well, right now, me and you are getting on forty five minutes. I'm not sure how long you have to go. We may have to do round two on this, right? And that's fine with sure. me if it's fine with you. I have no yeah, problem yeah. with that. Well, let's but, let me let me touch on some biblical stuff real quick. Just sure. maybe some stories in the Bible that don't work on a ball, okay? Sure. Because, like I said, we could go through the scriptures, which they uh, there's two scriptures that people have an issue with. They have an issue with Isaiah forty twenty two and Job twenty six seven. There's over 200 verses in the Bible that talk about the nature of this place. Those are the only two with any amb any ambiguity. All the others describe a still flat earth set on pillars under a dome. Over 70 times it talks about the sun, moon, and stars is moving, and not once talks about the earth is moving. In fact, it says it's fixed and immovable in, in multiple places. But Isaiah 40, 22, Isaiah talks about the circle of the earth. And people say, see, Isaiah knew it was a ball. Well, no, a circle and a ball are different things, okay? You can Google the difference between a circle and a ball. They're very different, right? We, we flat earthers think the earth is a, is a circle, right? We just think it's circle and round and flat like a pizza, okay? So um, Isaiah and Isaiah 22, 18 used the Hebrew word for ball, but he was not describing the earth. When he was describing the earth, he called it a circle. In Job 26, 7, it says that the earth is the earth hangs on nothing, okay? Which kind of sounds like a ball floating in space, but earth only means land. And yes, it's correct. The earth is not hanging on anything. The earth is set on pillars and on a foundation, just like it says later in that same book, the same book of Job. And, and that's actually God talking and not Job. So I think he would he would understand, you know, um, uh, his own his own building. And you know, we talked about Jesus earlier. According to John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, Jesus was there at creation, right? And Jesus had that conversation saying, talking about Hebrew cosmology, talking about the, the sun being darkened and the moon not giving her light and all the stars falling. Jesus also had a conversation with the Pharisees calling them hypocrites saying, hey, he said, you understand the face of the sky and the earth but you don't understand the time in which you live. So he was saying, you understand how this place works, but you don't understand the urgency of the age in which you live. And so he didn't correct what their cosmology was. You have the story in Joshua where Joshua prays for God to stop the sun and so that he can have more time to essentially chase down and kill the Amalekites that he's, that he's fighting. And God honors his request. God stops the sun and moon and he stops them over specific cities. Like it talks about the cities that they stop over, right? Uh, forgive me for saying right, but um, <laughs> so stops them over specific cities. Now, a baller could say, well, God just stopped the earth from spinning. Okay. One, the earth spins at a thousand miles an hour at the equator. So everything on earth would die if that happened. But the earth, the moon also stopped. Okay. The moon is not tied to the earth sun relationship. So if the earth had just stopped spinning, the moon would have kept going. But the Bible clearly says that the sun and the moon stopped which is interesting. Um, well, you have the time it was written in and people understand astronomy. Right. As you understand it today, it would be like, that's a big feat in itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've got, you've got the devil that takes Jesus up to a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. Well, that's tough to do on a ball. You've got Jesus coming back in the clouds when all the world will see. Well, that's tough to do on a ball. Um, you've got, uh, it, it constantly talks about the face of the earth. It talks about the face of the deep. It talks about the firmament being created on day two, which divides the waters above from the waters below. And the firmament, a lot of Bibles will translate that as expanse and, you know, trying to figure out how to fit space into that. But, but in Job, it talks about how the firmament is strong, how it's a molten looking glass. It's a sea of glass that God sits on. And, and so in my mind, that's a, that's a really bad translation. The, the word planet is only used one time in the King James, and it's like in 2 Kings somewhere, 23.5. Forgive me if that's wrong. But if you look up the Strongs, the, the Hebrew word behind it is constellation or sign of the zodiac. So um, the, the planets are just wandering stars. Uh, and, and the word planet, the, the, the root word for planet, is actually used in 2 Thessalonians when it says God will send a strong delusion 
that word for delusion is the word plane, which is the root word for planet. So that's interesting as, as well. Um, like I said, you've got, you've got over 200 verses that talk about a still, so motionless, flat earth, set on pillars, under a dome, within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed. And Now, correct me if I'm wrong before you move on. You Supposedly, Dave says, you guys have a video that talk about the 200 verses, right? You have a video? I, I don't personally have a video talking about the 200. There's a couple of people out there that have logged the, um, <clears throat> all the verses that reference it. And, you know, some of them are, you know, a little ambiguous, but if you put them together with the whole, they, they make sense. Okay. Um, so the, the Bible talks about how God pressed down on the land like clay to a seal. So if you, if you picture um, an ancient emperor who had the, the seal of his ring and when he would seal a letter, you know, he'd press down on the clay while it was still hot. You know, God didn't, it talks about that's how God formed the land. So how do you how do you form a ball by pressing down on it? You don't, right? right? And so when you push when you push down on that, it would make the edges rise up. No, and exactly. Yeah, like like you see in the wax seals, like you're talking about. Exactly. And so actually, you brought up a very good one too. Think everyone should think pizza, pizza crust. Uh, yeah, pizza's great. So you know the pizza we think the crust is Antarctica. That is the ends of the earth, right? And we think the the center is the North Pole directly beneath the throne of God. We think that the northern lights, and I'm talking about biblical flat earthers, northern lights are the emerald rainbow that circles the throne of God that John saw in Revelation 4, 3. He saw an emerald rainbow around the throne of God. Well, the Bible talks about how the throne of God is above the sides of the north, which is in the center of the flat earth, right above the dome. So, you know, and I, and I live, I, I used to live in Texas. I live in Northern Alberta. I see the Northern Lights every once in a while. It's quite a different experience seeing them thinking that they are the Emerald Rainbow around the throne <laughs> of God, right? It's, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, Bible talks about the sun, moon, and stars is moving. And, and it says the earth is fixed and immovable. It says that he established it. It says over and over that, that the earth does not move. And, and I have these conversations a lot with my, my Christian friends saying, you know, I just, I feel like God, if this all is imagery and metaphor, I feel like he would have used something that would have more aligned with the heliocentric model if the heliocentric model is true. Oh, no, don't get me wrong. Ever since I started talking to, say, now you you and Dave, it's been like, well, I can see where the holes are being punched. I mean, I, I still have things to rectify, you know what I mean? Because you're taught this know throughout your whole life this is what it is it's very hard as an adult to assume a new philosophy than it is as a, a young person um absolutely right so it's definitely it's definitely life-changing and and you know uh, takes a uh, takes a lot and also you know a lot of people won't even be open-minded at our age to consider new philosophies and and new possibilities and probabilities you know depending on how you look at it and not saying yes. it's truth just saying that what you believe can be wrong. Right? Sure, sure. And, I mean, you know, one of the big things for me as I started looking into it, because I felt immediately like, man, this is truth. I felt like God gave me a revelation. But but a lot of times when trying to explain to someone, that feeling is not good enough for them, right? Because they don't have the same feeling that I had. So when I started looking at NASA and their own website and how, oh, I didn't realize that all this outer space stuff is artist drawings, like the, the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, of course we haven't been far enough away to take a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. It's an artist's conception. You just got to look. It's right there. And but when see, NASA, that's, where I, that's where I draw the line of what is real and what is not real, because supposedly the Hubble telescope takes pictures of galaxies all the time, that it's thousands and thousands of miles away from Earth, taking all these major pictures of planets and galaxies, but yet we don't have one of ours? Right. Absolutely. You know, Or the, at least a chunk of ours? There, There is a difference between a photograph and an image. A photograph is taken, either digitally or you know, through the old process. An image is created to represent something, usually in art. And what NASA still admittedly employs artists like they they will take um, readings of a spot of the sky and they'll see that the light dips on on a certain star. And they'll say, well, that's probably because it has a planet that orbits it. Let's draw what we think people's perception of that planet would would be. And let's not make it look too much like Earth because we don't want to give them 
the, the wrong idea that there might be life without proving it, but we're going to draw what we think that looks like. And I've got a great video on that on, on my site. People can look that up. But I would definitely tell you, send me the link. Let's put that below in the description, right? Sure. Let's put that sure. below in the description. And, and if you go look at the, there are no pictures of Earth from space. There are no photos. They're all images. If you go look at the Blue Marble series, they say that the last time an actual picture was taken of the Earth was on Apollo something in 1974. Well, how can that maybe? be? They got an international space station well above the well, Earth that supposedly can take pictures of the Earth anytime. The problem is, and I'm talking about a full picture of the Earth, that they are not far enough away to be able to take a full picture of the Earth. And if you look at the Blue Marble series, it says that it is stitched together composites using satellite data and ground-based observations to fill in the gaps. The guy who created it in 2002 is quoted as saying, we created a flat map of the Earth and then wrapped it around the ball in Photoshop, added clouds, and... He didn't know it, but it ended up being that one that came on the iPhone. And he didn't know it was going to be on there until he actually got his first iPhone and, and it was on there. And he literally says, we, we built a flat map of the earth and wrapped it around the ball model. So it's just I'm surprised that information's not out there. It's out there. Like they, they, they aren't even hiding it. It's on NASA's website. It's, it's difficult to find, but it's, it's there. Have you seen it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book right now. I've got, um, I've got the quote in the book that the, of, of the guy speaking. I forget the guy's name, but he talks about how it, he, he's, his famous quote amongst flat earthers is, it is Photoshop because it has to be. And what he's insinuating is that we can't get far enough away to take an actual picture of the, of the globe. So, so let's, uh, let's do this because we're getting on 55 minutes. Let's stop there. Right. Sure. For everyone listening, we're going to do around two, me and you, correct? We can. Cool. This, yeah. is, this conversation is not something you can wrap up in a day. Um, me and you went, I think, like an hour and a half or an hour, 15 minutes, and we still have a lot more to talk about. But I, honestly, at this point, um, I don't want to get too far. We know people, a lot of people won't watch the full thing, and we're going to have to readdress some of this. So let's mean you put out a schedule for that. And 